All right. So uh, we started lecturing a little bit about uh, chapter one and chapter two. And again, in chapter one, there wasn't too much going on except for a little bit about, again, the scientific method. And then really into uh, chapter two last time, uh, we got into some important stuff. Uh, we talked about the idea of measurements and really units is sort of uh, what we were kind of focusing in on. And remember that whenever we do take a measurement, as we talked about, it needs to have a number and that unit. Again, it gives everybody a reference as to really what that number represents. Now, we do have different types of units, as we talked about. They're sort of the English uh, system of units, which is pretty much what we use here in the U.S. And then everybody else sort of uses the metric system. And as we talked about, there's a, sort of a standardized system of units that's used sort of in chemistry and other sciences, which is sometimes referred to as the SI system of units. And a reminder that really the sort of SI system is sort of based off the metric system. And um, there are different units, right, that re represent different types of measurements. Uh, so again, things like meters or lengths, right? Uh, things like... Uh, Cubic centimeters, for example, are volumes, um, and things like kilograms are masses. So we do want to remember sort of uh, what uh, each of those units represents, so that you know when we say something like we have a mass, uh, we're talking maybe grams or kilograms rather than milliliters, liters, which is obviously volumes. Now, in addition to that, uh, we did talk about uh, temperature. And there is sort of three types of temperature scales, degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. And really in chemistry, that is pretty much going to be the winner in, in most cases. Uh, pretty much all formulas, as we talked about, will need to kind of get into Kelvin in most cases. So we talked about how to convert between these. And if you want the temperature in Fahrenheit... Uh, that is 1.8 times the temperature in Celsius plus a 32. Uh, the temperature in Celsius would be temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32 uh, divided by 1.8. So those are two conversions between degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit, which, as I mentioned, probably outside of Chapter 2, not going to use all that much at all in the chemistry. Uh, the one that we do use the most really is to convert it into Kelvin. And that is uh, basically your temperature in Celsius plus 273. As we talked about last time, the real number is 273.15. Most people just go with 273. But again, if you want to use the 0.15 of it, you can. Uh, and then obviously, if you have Kelvin and want Celsius, you're going to be subtracting uh, the 273 from our Kelvin there. But out of all these, that definitely is the one that uh, we will use the most in chemistry. Um, but you do need to obviously know all of those formulas and how to do all those conversions. So if you did want to go from, say, Kelvin down to Fahrenheit, you do kind of have to use most of those equations there. And same thing, if you had Fahrenheit, you'd have to take it to Celsius and then Celsius to Kelvin in that sort of conversion way. Now, we talked a little bit about significant figures and it's kind of specifically when we're doing temperature conversions. And as we talked about, and specific for only temperature conversions is the idea that if you are just doing a temperature to temperature conversion, you should look make your converted number look like the original number. So again, if it was a whole number, when you convert it, it should be a whole number. If your original temperature went to the first decimal place and you converted it, your converted value should go to the first. So it is a slightly different rule than we'll talk about hopefully today uh, in terms of significant figures, but that's specific for just a temperature to temperature uh, conversion. We finished up, I think, talking about the idea of scientific notation. And scientific notation is n times 10 to the n, where again, that is a number between 1 and 10. And that is either a positive or a negative type number, depending on which way that you move it. And we use, obviously, scientific notation to handle really large numbers, really small numbers, so we don't, like, lose zeros along the way or anything like that. 
Um, the important part about that, a couple of things, as we talked about, that first number does need to be between one to 10, shouldn't be 10. So again, you shouldn't be writing any type of scientific notation where you write something like 100 times 10 to the whatever. Again, it does need to be a number between one and 10, nor should you really write scientific notation like point something times 10 to the whatever. So it needs to be between that one and 10. One is okay, uh, 10 not okay. So kind of between that um, is where you want it to be. But really uh, more importantly, I think where we ended up with, uh, besides writing numbers in scientific notation is again, to properly punch it into your calculator, uh, which I think is where we kind of finished up last time. Remember that as we talked about, all scientific calculators pretty much has an exponent button and they usually will now kind of look one of these three sort of combinations. And again, if you uh, have these two versus sort of that combination on your calculator, um, there's a couple of different things that you need to do. On the first one, you don't really need to do any type of parentheses. On the second one, you do need to put parentheses as we talked about and kind of went through it. A reminder as well that there is also a negative button on most calculators that looks something like this. And again, you do not want to use your subtract button when you're trying to punch something in like a negative exponent. So when you do put something like... Uh, 6.25 times 10 to the negative three, you would go 6.25, you would hit your exponent button, you would hit your negative button, and then you would hit three. Again, you do not hit the multiplication button, you do not hit like the shift log or anything like that, or second log button uh, when you punch something into scientific notation. Again, if you have the Buttons like this, you do have to parenthesis up that guy on both sides or every number that's a scientific notation. Uh, or again, your calculator really will do it uh, sort of incorrectly. Any questions on any of that stuff there? We talked about it last slide. Okay, so uh, we talked about punching it in. So let's do a couple of problems where, um, see how we do. So let's say we want to take... Uh, 3.25 times 10 to the negative 4, and let's divide it by 2.5 times 10 to the 14, and let's do uh, 1.4 times 10 to the negative 6, and we'll times it by 3.6 times 10 to the 19. All right, so punch each of those into your calculator correctly and scientific notation and see what you So again, uh, to punch the first one in, uh, we're going to go uh, 3.25, going to hit the exponent button, going to hit the negative button, and going to hit a 4. And again, on most people's calculators, it probably will look something like this, or maybe it'll look something like this or maybe up there um and then we're going to hey, obviously hit the divide button 2.5 once again going to do exponent button and in this case uh there is no negative so just going to do 14 and hit equals there so uh if we do that 3.25 exponent negative 4 divided by 2.5 exponent 14 we end up uh with 1.3 to the negative, uh, what we got there? 16, I believe. Let's try it again. 3.25. So we do end up with uh, 1.3 times 10 to the negative 18. Now, on my particular calculator, it displayed it as 1.3e negative 18. And again, that E part there represents the times 10 part of the number. When you write something in scientific notation, this is how it should look. You should not use this E. Yeah, so do not write scientific notation with the E. Make it times 10, uh, for example, to the minus 18 in this case. Any questions on that there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> What what's that? Say again. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Like it'll turn it into a decimal, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. It won't do it for the other one because uh, your calculator doesn't have enough room for it to put the zeros. On the other one, it just needs to get, it basically will just turn it into point zero 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 three two five. Um, but on the other one, because there's not enough room, it, it won't be able to do it. And some calculators may do that, may turn it when you punch it in scientific notation into like a decimal if they're, they're able to do so, or it may just leave it in scientific notation. We do it. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Also, a good point is obviously your calculator may not give you your answer in scientific notation, right? In all cases, unless you have a program to do so. Um, as we talked about last time, you don't necessarily have to give an answer in scientific notation unless it says to do so. Uh, but there may be instances where that's the only way that you can kind of give the correct answer in terms of significant figures, as we'll talk about. Um, the next one, same deal. We're going to basically punch it in uh, 1.4. Going to hit your exponent button. Going to hit your negative button, whichever one you have, and a 6. Going to hit your multiplication button. 3.6, exponent button, and 19, and then equals. Again, if you do have the kind of guy with the will and the times 10 to the end as your button, really, again, the only thing that you need to do is kind of parentheses up everybody there. Actually, before the equal sign there, I suppose, would be the right one to do. Uh, if you do all that, uh, 1.4, to the negative six times 3.6 uh, to the 19. In this case, going to get uh, 5.0 times 10 to the 13, we'll call it 5.04 on my calculator times 10 to the 14 um, would be our answer here. Any questions on how to punch those things in? Again, if you find yourself kind of having uh, this part of the number good, but this part's kind of off by like one or two. It's usually the way uh, that you're punching into your calculator. So if you're still not sure, again, come see me at some point. We'll figure it out on your particular calculator uh, when you do it. Again, I'm going to pass her on the roll sheet here. So autograph next to your name. The other thing we talked about with scientific notation is, again, when we do write a number in scientific notation, all the numbers before, for the time 10 part, right, are significant. Uh, so this particular number here would have two significant figures. And so would this one have two significant figures. Again, any of the numbers before the time 10 part, when a number is written in scientific notation is significant. Any questions on scientific notation exponent on calculators? Okay. All right, so uh, let's take a look at a couple of these here, uh, just in general, to turn them into scientific notation. Once again, uh, in this case, we are going to go one place and two places there to the left to do so. This would give us 5.68762 times 10 to the 2 as our number in scientific notation. Here on the next one, we do need to go one place, two places, three places, four places, five places, and six places to get to a number between one and 10. And that gives me 7.72 times 10. I lost count. I'm going to go with six. I think I said one, two, three, four, five, six. Here on this particular one, uh, nothing written, but we do assume that it's at the end. So one, two, three, and four four places there to the left to get it to a number between one and 10, 1 1.25 times 10 to the four. And lastly here, we just need to go one place to the right gives us 1.35 times 10 to the minus one. Now you may be wondering maybe why I kept all these numbers, why I got rid of these, why I got rid of those zeros. And it has to do with uh, how many significant figures there are in each of these numbers. When you take a number that's written in decimal form and you turn it into a number of scientific notation, you should never lose the significant figures, nor should you lose it going the other way. So uh, we'll talk about officially how to count significant figures, but needless to say, all of these numbers in this particular case are significant. 
And that is why we hung on to all those numbers there. And in this case here, these zeros at the end are not significant, which is why we got rid of them when we went to significant figure or scientific notation. And none of these zeros here before the seven are significant. So we got rid of them as well. So uh, there is actually a reason why we kind of trimmed off some of these numbers and others we did not. And we'll talk officially, obviously, about counting sig figs and why we did those guys. But any questions on how to turn them into scientific notation here? All right, so just to finish up here, we'll talk about it, but these are not significant zeros. So one, two, three, four, five gives us 4.25 times 10 to the five, and these would be meters. And here we would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven places gives us eight times 10 to the negative seven. And these would be grams. As we talked about last time as well, again, uh, positive exponents, larger numbers, negative exponents, smaller number. Uh, it's a good way to sort of remember it should be negative or positive, whichever way you go. Any question on those two there? All right, so let's get into really sort of uh, sig figs and how we sort of figure out sig figs and really sort of where they come from. And really, um, a lot of it comes from measurements. And whenever we take any type of measurement, regardless of what type of measurement it is, there's always going to be some degree of uncertainty with that measurement. Uh, the degree of uncertainty will depend on the piece of equipment that you're using. Some pieces of equipment are much better to take measurements than others, which is why when we do take measurements, you know, we try to choose the right piece of equipment to take a proper measurement. Um, it helps a lot. So, for example, if we uh, if we take a look at a ruler here. And we'll just say these are centimeters and we'll call this uh, one, we'll call that two. And let's just say we wanted to measure an arrow we got going on here. We'll lay it up right about there maybe. Okay, so whenever you're going to take any type of measurement, the very first thing that you really wanna do is look at the piece of equipment you're using to take that measurement and you really want to figure out sort of what is the markings or the scale on it? What do they represent? And usually when you look at some piece of equipment that has markings on it, there's usually two types of markings that you see. There's usually what I sort of refer to as the large markings, which are those guys that usually have kind of the numbers next to them. And there's usually kind of the smaller markings which are the guys that oftentimes do not have numbers next to them by little markings until you get to the next kind of big number. So if we look at this particular scale here, which is our ruler, the big markings is the first one is one, the next one is two, right? So the value of the big markings here is basically one centimeter, right? So we wanted to also figure out, you know, how many of the little markings we got going on until we get from kind of one big guy to the next. So it's important to count it. And it's important that when you look at a scale like this, where you start to count and where you end to count. So typically speaking, we start counting the little markings after the last big marking. So when I go to count, I'm gonna count this as my first little marking, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and I'm going to end at the next big marking. So kind of start past the next first marking, big marking, stop at the next large marking. I have 10 marks in between one centimeter. That means in this particular case, each of the smallest markings represents how much? Each one here represents 0.1 centimeter right this would be 
1.1, right? 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. 1.7, 1.8, 1 1.9, and then two as we go over there. Any questions on that there? So <clears throat> when we take a measurement, no matter who takes the measurement, no matter who looks at it or whatever it may be, there should always be certain numbers that pretty much everybody agrees upon, right? So for example, here, if we look at my arrow, everybody should agree it is at least 1.4, right? It's not quite 1.5, it's more than 1.4 for sure. So when you take a measurement, you should always record all of the certain numbers, which in this case is 1.4. Thank you. Now, when we look at it, the arrow, it clearly is not at 1.4, it's not at 1.5. So this is really where sort of the uncertainty in the measurement comes into. It's really where it's sometimes referred to as estimation that has to happen. Now, I may look at it and go, well, I think it's sort of like right between the two markings there, 1.4 and 1.5. So I think it's like halfway there. So I may record that digit as being, say, a 5 and obviously the unit as well. Somebody else may look at that and go, well, I think it's kind of closer to the 1.5 marking there. So maybe it's like a six, a seven or something like that. And this number here is what is referred to as being the first uncertain digit. And Whenever you take a measurement, you should always record all the certain numbers plus the first uncertain number. And really, when you do that, that is really what uh, significant figures are. Yeah. So when you record in a measurement all the certain numbers plus that first uncertain number, that is like what we like to call significant figures, right? which means this particular measurement has how many significant figures? It has three significant figures. All those numbers are significant. The uncertainty lies in the last significant figure in this case. So basically what you're saying in most cases is, I think it's 1.45, but maybe it's like 1.46, maybe it's like 1.47. So a lot of times you think about it as sort of plus or minus one of that last significant figure is where the variance is. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> you can figure out the uncertainty uh, by looking at the measurements that's on the scale and figure out how many the smaller division is. So we'll get back to that in just a second. Let's take a look at another sort of example here. Let's say we were going to measure out liquid here. Say these are milliliters. And we'll say we will put a liquid in here. Now, first off, whenever we put a liquid into a glass container, typically what happens is we will see the curvature of the liquid. I will exaggerate it there. And that is what is known as the meniscus. And we usually read always from the bottom of the meniscus. And the reason we really read from the bottom of the meniscus in most cases, especially when it looks like that sort of U, is because what we are actually seeing is the attractive force between the liquid and the glass container is actually stronger than the liquid in itself. So what happens on the edge where they're in contact with each other, a little capillary action, they start rising up the edge of the glass. And that's what causes that curvature of the liquid to occur. And that man means that if we really didn't have that attractive force, 
really it would all be down here pretty much where the volume is actually at so that's why we read from the bottom of the meniscus the curvature and the lifting of the liquid on the side is an attractive force so the true volume is really at the bottom of the meniscus probably nine times out of ten or more that is what the meniscus looks like there are actually uh, substances where the substance is actually more attracted to itself than the glass container mercury is an example of that if you ever see mercury it actually has a meniscus that goes the opposite way it kind of goes bevels upwards and you would read from the top of the meniscus in that case but if you have a meniscus that's making like a u always from the bottom of the meniscus is where you read it so when we look at something like this again we want to look at our scaling here and we can see that our larger number markings represents how much we have 10 milliliters and then the next marking is 20 which means in this case each of the larger markings represents 10 milliliters right so we got a 10 milliliter spread between our larger markings in this case if we are to count our smaller markings in this case looking at starting after the big marking so that's one two three four five six, seven, eight, nine, and now 10 markings here between 10 and 20. That means in this case, each of the smallest markings represent how much? Yeah, small markings represents one milliliter, right? That's 11, that's 12, that's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 in this case. Any questions on how to read the markings there? All right, so we have our meniscus and depending on the piece of glass where you're looking at, it may be easier to see some cases, it may be kind of harder to see the meniscus, but you kind of want to look for the bottom. So if we sort of do this and my bad straight line drawing will go somewhere in the that region. So again, we want to record definitely all the certain numbers so everybody could see it is at least 14 in this case so we would want to record 14 and these again would be our certain numbers once again here is not exactly at 14 but not quite at 15 so you want to look at it and try to decide and in this case well, maybe it isn't exactly half. Maybe it's a little above half, right? So maybe I want to record 14.7. And again, the units, which would be milliliters. This would be my uncertain number. That would mean this measurement has how many significant figures? It has three significant figures. All of them would be significant. Again, here, what you're saying is basically... I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of 14.7, but maybe it's like 14.6, a little less. Maybe it's like 14.8. It's somewhere in that ballpark. There's some uncertainty in that exact location, um, but we're pretty close in that area. Any questions about there? <clears throat> so it's really important to make sure that you do look at the scaling and you want to figure out the largest markings. You want to figure out the uh, smallest markings, what they represent. And it does change. And it can be different even if you're like in a lab, for example, and you're standing next to somebody and they, you both have like your 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. They were made by different people and they have different scales on it. It could actually be different. So you always want to make sure that you do look you know, at your uh, glassware. So for example, here, let's just say we had... Uh, something like this. And we'll put some type of liquid in there. Let's say we went. Yeah. That's a very, very badly drawn meniscus, but we'll go with it anyways. All right. All right. So. Largest markings on this one is how much? Unless it's the large markings represent. Does represent 10 milliliters, right? There are how many of the smaller markings that we see there? If I zoom in. We have one, two, 
three, four, and five markings only, right? That means each of the smallest markings represents how much? It does represent two milliliters in this case, right? Any questions on that? That means if we look at the small markings, uh, we got like a 12, 14, 16, 18. Now, when I look at my volume here, I am between 12 and 14. What comes between 12 and 14? 13. On this particular scale, the best I could do is say 13 milliliters. And that is because between 12 and 14 on this particular scale, there's no way to know where 12 ends, where 13 starts, right? And ends. there's not enough room to sort of visually do and visualize kind of where one starts and where one ends. So the best we could do is this, which means in this particular case, how many significant figures would this number have? This number would have only two significant figures. Which one would be the estimated digit or uncertain digit? It would be the three. So basically what we're saying here is like, I think it's 13, but hey, it could be 14, could be 12, somewhere in that ballpark. A lot of uncertainty on this, right? Which one is a better one to use if you wanted a more sort of accurate measurement between those two scales? You would probably want to use the one on the left, right? So you definitely know kind of where you're at. You could take it to more digits, right? More significant figures. A much better measurement can be made than the guy on the right. Here, the certain number would be the one. The uncertain number would be the three in this case. And um, in some cases, you cannot do what the general rule is. And the general rule is usually this, that in most cases, you could take a reading to one more place to the right of the smallest digit, the smallest marking. So if we look at the guy on the left here, smallest marking is the first decimal uh, or the whole number. We could go one more place to the right, which allows us to go to the first decimal place. If we looked at our first one, smallest marking is here. We could go one more place to the right uh, to take the actual reading. So. General rule is, in most cases, one more place to the right of the smallest marking is where you want to be in terms of your reading. That is really what you do. Now, you can mathematically figure out sort of the uncertainty or the precision of the equipment by doing a little calculation. So, for example, on this particular one, if I take the smallest marking and divide by two, so if I take my smallest marking here and divide it by two, that gives me 0 0.05 centimeters. That is sort of the precision of the equipment, which means you could give this measurement, or sometimes they will want you to give this measurement as 1.45 plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters, right? And that's sort of the precision that you could do. What this number, the 0 0.05, will tell you is 0 0.05 has how many decimal places? Two. That's exactly the number of decimal places you should have in your measurement. It's exactly where that goes to. So it will tell you basically how far you should take that reading to uh, by doing that little part there. You can see it on this one here again uh, on the guy on the left. Our smallest marking is one milliliter. So if we take one milliliter and divide it by two, we get 0 0.5 milliliters, which means this could be 14.7 plus or minus 0 0.5 milliliters. 0 0.5 milliliters has one decimal place, and that is exactly how far you should take the reading in this case to one decimal place. It even works with this one, which isn't the best scale, right? Smallest marking on the guy here on the right was two milliliters, right? If I divide it by two, I end up with one milliliter, right? Which means this would be 13 milliliters plus or minus one milliliter. Whole number, whole number. So if you want to sort of mathematically figure out sort of how far you could take each of the readings, you could do what sometimes refer to sort of the precision of the equipment, take the smallest marking divided by two, and that gives you the plus or minus range of where that measurement is going to be. And also will just tell you like, okay, that's how far I should actually take the reading to. Any questions on that there?
Now, it's really important when you take a measurement that you do take it to the proper number of significant figures. Uh, so let's take a look at another example here. Let's actually go back. Uh, maybe we'll steal this guy here. So let's steal this scale here. All right. All right, so let's say we have this same ruler we were using before, and let's say we wanted to actually measure this guy, like, and it's dead on the line, yeah? So it's like dead on that line. What should I record as the measurement? Can I record 1.5 centimeters? Can I record... 1.50 centimeters, 1.50000 centimeters. I'm going to say no on that. Extra zeros doesn't always make it more scientific, right? All right. So we have two numbers here, 1.5 and 1.50. So is there a difference in terms of these two numbers? So let's see. Let's talk about first. Uh, the 1.5 centimeters. 1.5 centimeters would have how many significant figures? It would have two significant figures. Right? Which means the uncertain number here, or the estimated number, would be which number? It would be the 5. So basically what we're saying on this, right, is I think it's 1.5. But, you know, maybe it's like 1.4 and maybe it's like 1.6, you know, with that uncertainty, right, in that last digit. So there's somewhere in that ballpark of where it is. When we look at the next number here, how many significant figures does this number have? It does have three significant figures, right? So we got 1.50 centimeters. Uncertain number here is which one? It is the zero. And that means that we're really saying with this measurement, I think it's 1.50, but maybe it's like 1.49, or maybe it's like 1.51, right? Now, when we look at actually the scale that we're using, and we look at actually where my arrow is, is it anywhere near these two numbers, 1.6 and 1.4? That's a pretty big range of like i'm not sure error right and that's not actually what we see when we look at this right this is like more this right it is somewhere in that ballpark right one that's like that range of error right about there and in this particular case the proper measurement is not this number because frankly by lopping off that zero which you should have in this case you made that number a really crappy measurement. Yeah, you made it a, a pretty crappy measurement. There is so much error in that, and it doesn't really reflect the ability that your equipment can take it to, right? Your equipment is actually much better than that 1.5 measurement that you put up there. It's actually much better as the error is really much smaller in that particular case. So in a case where something hits like dead on a number, it's a very common thing. People will just like lop off, the, eh, we don't really need the extra numbers or anything like that. And every time you do that, you're really kind of making your measurement pretty crappy and stuff like that. So you should never, ever uh, lose a number or anything like that. You should keep it if it is significant. And in this particular case, if you hit exactly on an, a line or something like that, you need to preserve the proper number of digits by putting a zero there. And that's what we see here. We know that for sure on this piece of equipment, that is where we could take it to, right? So we should have two decimal places. And that preserves not only the proper reading, but it actually preserves a much better measurement than if you took it off. Any questions on that? So do not lop off zeros. Make sure you add zeros if you need to maintain the proper reading because it actually does make a big difference in terms of what you're telling somebody. If you use that first measurement, the 
not that great of a measurement. There's a big room for error in that measurement is what you're telling somebody. Any questions, all that. That also goes for a very common mistake that people make is if you use anything that is a digital display, yes, all the numbers are significant. Yeah, they're there for a reason. So you should always record all the numbers. That includes like balances. When you go to the back of the room and you use those balances, which are digital, you should always record all the numbers that are there because they wouldn't be there on a digital sort of uh, display if they weren't significant. So you should always record all those numbers. Any questions on any of that there? So really always important to look at the scale, make sure that you take it to the proper number of digits. And even if you hit exactly on a marking, make sure you preserve the proper number of digits if you need to by adding a zero in there to maintain it. Um, the uncertain number is not always uh, the last number that's written, but it is always the last significant figure that is written. So keep that in mind. So. When you're asked about the uncertain measurement or estimated digit, it's not necessarily always the last one written, but it definitely is the last significant figure that is written in that number. And we'll talk about that in just a second here. Any questions on measurements? All right. So let's take a look at some examples. I think we got some ones to look at maybe. All right, so. All right, so as I mentioned before, custom to record all the certain numbers plus that first uncertain number are sometimes referred to as the uh, estimated digit. When we do take measurements, uh, there is also a couple of things or words that sometimes is used um, interchangeably, but they actually do mean different things. So sometimes accuracy or being accurate or precision or being precise, these are two different words and they do have two different meanings. When we talk about accuracy, that is really how close a measurement is uh, to the true value. So if you're really accurate, you're like right on what the value should be, the actual true value it is. Precision on the other hand is how close a set of values our measurements are to one another. So precision is like a grouping of numbers and how close they are to one another. Precision is a lot of times what we look at and why in experiments like in chemistry, you do multiple trials to see whether it is repeatable. Like you get the same value every time you do the experiment. You have high precision because you're able to be reproduced and you end up with the same thing. So an example is obviously uh, here we'll do a little darts on a very badly drawn dartboard. Uh, but we're looking for uh, the bullseye in the middle. So I throw my first darts. I hit here. I hit here. All right. Maybe I missed the board there. Happens. Am I very accurate? No. Am I very precise? I am not. So in the interest of fun, I say, hey, why don't we do double or nothing? And I throw my darts again. And I go, I'm going to go with the red darts this time. Maybe it'll be better. So I'm gonna go boom, boom, and boom. Am I accurate? I am not, I'm shooting for the bullseye, right? Am I precise? I'm precisely not accurate, right? So you can be very precise at doing something. You could do it wrong all the time, the same way, but it's never right, but you do it wrong. You're consistent at least, right? So right. it's possible to be very precise, but not very accurate. And again, in an experiment, you could repeat doing something wrong all the time, but you do it the same way. So you'll get the same answer every time. Um, so you can be very precise, but not very accurate. So I will uh, go, uh, all right, let's go uh, triple or nothing. So I take my darts and I throw my darts. I go boom, boom, and boom. Am I accurate? Am I precise? I probably hustled you as well, by the way, just so you know, but uh, I am both accurate and precise. And when you do experiments in chemistry and science, right, you want to be accurate, right? You want to try to get your measurements to what the true value is, right, or whatever that may be. Uh, but you also want to be precise, which means you want to be able to do your experiments repeatable, right? You want to be able to keep getting that same sort of value. But as the earlier demonstration there shows, you definitely can be precise without being accurate. So the goal is obviously try to be both there, both precise and accurate. And again, taking readings to 
uh, the proper number of digits um, really helps you kind of narrow in on both of those things. So again, every time you sort of lose a number, don't take a reading to the proper number of sig figs, you're probably moving your darts more and more off the board, right? So you want to kind of keep both of those things happening in the same thing. Any questions on the difference between accuracy and precision? Now, in terms of accuracy and precision, a lot of times in sort of chemistry, we calculate something known as percent error. Maybe you've heard of percent error is something that we look at in terms of accuracy. Uh, a small percent error is usually what you look for. Percent error tells us how close we are to the true value. Uh, when we look at precision, percent deviation or standard deviation, that is when we look at sort of precision, uh, how close numbers are to each other. All right, so let's take a look at some here. So take a moment here and pick the proper, if nothing shifted, hopefully the proper reading for that blue line based on this scale, which one it is. Okay, let's take a look. So once again, we want to look at our large markings, which in this case is our two and a three, which go to those lines, by the way. Um, so our large markings here, once again, are going to be one centimeter in this case. We want to count our smaller markings, which look like dots in this situation. So we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So once again, here we have 10 markings between one centimeter. So our smaller markings, right, is going to be 0.1 centimeters, right? So normal, we know we could go one more place to the right of the smallest marking. We could verify this in this case by taking our smallest marking and dividing by two, 0 0.05 centimeters. So that really tells us we should take this reading to two decimal places. So if you want to just do that up front, you know how far you should take it. Here we can see it is definitely uh, two, two point six there. This little dot here is 2.7. So it's not quite to the 2.7, but it definitely is 2.6. So here we want to make our estimate, right? And it is going to be pretty close there. So I would say nine and centimeters. Significant figures on this guy is going to be three significant figures, right? Our nine being our uncertain death, uh, digit. And we already know from our calculation here, plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters. So that looks like uh, D is a winner here, I think, in this case. Any questions on how we got there? Let's take a look at another one here, I think. All right, what is the proper reading for the red line? Once again, the big numbers go with the big dashes there. So this is really mine right there, 10. Okay, looking at this again, uh, our large markings here, uh, we got nine and we got 10. So that's going to be uh, one centimeter. Once again, if we count our smaller markings starting past the large markings, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. <laughs> That gives us again, 10 markings, uh, which means each of our small markings here are going to be 0 0.1 centimeters in this case. Any questions on that? Now, in this case, this is multiple choice. You could just uh, divide this by two, which tells us we should take this reading to plus or minus 0 0.05 or two decimal places. Uh, which definitely should eliminate everybody except for this guy. But let's see how we get there. If it was a multiple choice, uh, we would here again, take our certain number, which definitely it looks like it's past that nine. Uh, this first little dash here would be 9.1. So it's definitely not 0.1. So it's got to be less than that, right? And again, it's just past that nine. So between that nine and that point one is like, you know, 9.01, 9.02, 9.03, and so forth, all the way up. Um, so in this case, you might even call it 9.01, but they called it 9.02 centimeters 
plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters. Now we know from our calculation there that we should only be going to two decimal places, which is why we know for sure this number is incorrect as well. Although it is sort of in the same ballpark, it is taken to too many digits in this particular case. D would have how many significant figures the way it's written? D would have four significant figures the way it's written. The five would be the uncertain number, which is like you're saying, this is 9.004 or six. The C has three significant figures, right? The uncertainty there is in that two at the end, which is saying, I think it's 9.02, but it might be 9.01 or 9.03, which again, if you look at the scaling there, that's pretty much the ballpark it's in, right? That's basically what you can kind of determine. Any questions on how to take those readings? All right. So let's take a look at some other things. We talked about it a second ago here. Uh, our meniscus, and if it does curve sort of upwards, again, the result of that is the attraction between the glass. But the true value should be at the bottom here. So if we look at this particular one here uh, to see how they got there, this is our big marking, and that is our big marking, uh, which means our large marking here is going to be 10 milliliters. If we count our smaller markings along the way, uh, which is over here, this is uh, 30. <laughs> so uh, our small marking counting there to start with, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Obviously again, I put a mark there, but not counting the 30. <laughs> um, <clears throat> If we look at it, we could see that we definitely are on the seven-ish range in that area. So that is seven right there. So that is our 36, I'm sorry, that's 36, where our 36 comes from. And again, it is between that 36 and 37 marking, which is above here, 37, and that is 36. So our estimate here being uh, 0.8, and because it is one milliliter, the smallest markings, we divide it by two tells us we should take it to plus or minus 0.5 or one decimal place in this case. All right, so let's take a look at, this is more zoomed in there so you can kind of see that. This is actually uh, what is referred to as a burette and burettes are a little bit different Burettes are actually filled from the top and they dispense out the bottom. So uh, the graduate cylinder is filled from the top, but you pour it out the top. This is filled from the top and you dispense it out the bottom. So you put a funnel up here, you fill it, and then you open this guy up and it drips out basically the bottom and stuff like that. So the scaling here is actually a little bit different when you look at a burette like this, uh, maybe hard to see here, but up here is actually zero. And then it will go one, and then it will go two, and so forth. It actually increases as you go down, which means in general, if it increases as you go down, when you look at the scaling, if I am sitting somewhere in this region, my volume is one point something, not two. Yeah, so it increases as you go down. So people oftentimes when they have something like a burette, make incorrect reading. So for example, if I filled this up to the very top, and let's just say this is a, a 50 milliliter burette. If I filled it all the way up to zero, you should always record what the number says, which is 0, 0.00. You should not record 50. Yeah, So people always want to do that. Oh, this whole thing holds 50 up to the top, it is 50 but you should always record what the actual reading says, especially when you're using a burette, otherwise you'll get your values sort of wrong when you're doing your experiment. So it's a very common mistake. We'll talk about it when we use it later on, but definitely always record when you look at the scaling, whatever the actual number is, not what you think it represents, yeah. Um, so if we look at this here, we're actually going to do the same thing. So this guy right here is a big marking. This guy is a big marking, and again, uh, we are exiting the, the solution this way. So our large marking in this case is going to be 
one milliliter. And if we look between each of these guys here, We have uh, one marking, two markings, three markings, four markings, five markings, six markings, seven markings, eight markings, nine markings, and 10 markings. Again, I'm counting downward. That means each of these smaller markings represents how much? Represents 0 0.1 milliliters. This first one would be 28.1, 28.2. I could write that right, 28.2, 28.3, and so forth as you continue down until you hit to 29. That means I know that if I take the smallest markings here and divide it by two, I should be able to take my reading to plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters, which is two decimal places. So I should be able to take my reading to two decimal places. My meniscus is over here. this region it is below the 28 above the 29 which means the certain number here is actually 28 again it increases as you go down it's not exactly at the 29 mark which would be 28.9 there that's 28.8 so i think it's halfway between ish or a little bit more actually it looks like almost to the 28.9 so they recorded eight five and again here to two decimal places as we would expect in most BRS that you use that is usually what you take it to to two decimal places because you have the ability to go one more place to the right of the smallest marking smallest marking being 0.1 milliliters you have that ability to go one more place to the right most people would probably call it maybe 28.80 or something like that but they went with that or 28.90 they felt it was almost on that line this would have how many significant figures here? It would have four. The uncertain number would be that last five. Yeah, it would be there. Any questions on that reading? All right, so take a moment here. Take a proper reading of what you see here. I'll zoom it up a little bit there. Maybe it'd be easier to see. Again, this is also a burette that's increasing as you go down. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so we're going to go with our big markings here, our larger markings. Uh, so that's 20 and 30. Uh, so large markings here going to be 10 milliliters. In this particular case here, we got, uh, hard to see, but uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 markings in between that. That means in this case, each small marking represents how much? One milliliter, right? So this represents one milliliter. And again, we could find our sort of precision here. So uh, we will divide that by two, which tells us plus or minus 0 0.5 milliliters, or we should be taking our reading to really the first decimal place here. In this case, it looks like it's hanging right on that second marking. Uh, which would be 22 in this case, which would be our certain number, right? Again, because this piece of equipment has the ability to go to one more place to the right, we should preserve that by putting the zero, right? If I did not put the zero, 22 would have how many significant figures? Two, and the uncertain number would be the two. If I put in the zero there, the uncertain number now is the zero, which means it has three significant figures. And the uncertainty is like in that last digit. So now it's like 22.1, 21.9 in that ballpark, rather than 22 and 23 and 24 uh, in terms of sort of the uncertainty that is there. So something like this, I think. And I think that might be D in this case, yeah. Any questions on taking measurements? Say, say one more time. What's the difference between, did you say uh, B and D? Yeah, between B and D is 
There is no difference in terms of this part. This part is correct for this particular piece of equipment. But the difference really is in the measurement that was taken. Um, this guy here would have at 22 milliliters would have two significant figures, which is basically you're saying the uncertainty would be here. So what you're saying in that particular case is I think it's 22, but maybe it's 21 or 23. So that's a pretty big room for error, right? Here, we have 22.0 milliliters, which has three significant figures. And this would be the uncertain number there, which means you're saying, I think it's 22.0, but maybe it's, uh, I'll do math, 21.9 or 22.1. So this range of error is really what we see here, right? We can kind of see it's like right on that line. It's really not near 21, which is what you might be saying here, or it's not really near 23, which is what you would be saying here. So because this piece of equipment has the ability to go to the first decimal place, which I know from that calculation there is how far you should take it to, you have to preserve that measurement with that zero to preserve the proper sig figs when you take it. Otherwise, if you wrote the first one, you made the measurement a lot crappier than it should be, and a worse measurement, really, than it should be. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, so when you take measurements, you need to make sure, obviously, take it to the proper number of digits. Uh, include the zeros if you need to. Don't add extra zeros if you don't need to. So just as bad as really uh, taking off some zeros adding extra zeros to make it more scientific -y or chemistry-like uh, is not good either. Because again, you're telling somebody it's way better of a measurement, right? Than it actually was. So you got to hit it on the nose in terms of where you should take it. Any questions like that? <clears throat> All right, so we've been talking about significant figures. So let's talk about really the rules for counting significant figures. And there are a few rules. So let's take a look here. So first off, Starting with any non-zero is going to be a significant figure. When we have a measurement or anything like that, uh, we always start counting left to right in the number. And we do not start counting significant figures until we hit the very first non-zero. So that's where you should start counting. So left to right, hit the first non-zero. That is where you should start counting your significant figures. So one, two, five, nine, obviously starting on the left there has four significant figures. They would all be significant. Zeros, which gives people a, a difficult time in a lot of cases. Uh, there's three types of zeros. There's the leading zero, and those are not significant. There's kind of like placeholders. So when we look at a number like this, none of these zeros are important. We don't hit the first non-zero until we hit the four. And at that point, that is where we start counting. So the four and the nine is going to be significant. And this guy would have two significant figures in that case. Again, don't start counting until you hit the first non-zero. Now, there are zeros that are trapped between two non-zeros, or sometimes called captive zeros, trap zeros. They are going to be significant. So we would start counting here at the five, as that's the first non-zero. The zeros in the middle would be significant. The four at the end would be significant. And this guy would have four significant figures. The last type of zero, which gives people difficulty, is the zeros that come at the end, or sometimes referred to as trailing zeros. The problem with those is they may or may not be significant. What determines whether or not they're significant is, is there a decimal point anywhere in the number? Doesn't have to be near the zeros, but anywhere in that number, if there is a decimal point, those zeros at the end would be significant. So when we write something like 600, like we see there, no decimal point written, this would have only one significant figure, which would be the six. If I were to write it like this, it will now have three significant figures because there is a decimal, these zeros here now become significant three significant figures, one significant figure. So if I had a number like this, how many significant figures does that number have? It has two significant figures. There's no decimal point written, right? 
where is the uncertain number? Which one is the uncertain or estimated number? It is the two. Yeah. So this is what I was talking about earlier. The two is not the last number, right? Um, so it is the last significant figure, which is the two. So it may not always be the last number written if you're asked sort of what is the estimated or, or uncertain number, but it is the last significant figure. So since this has only two significant figures, uh, that two would be it. This is why if I were to turn this into scientific notation, this would be 1.2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. How many significant figures does this have in scientific notation? Two. This is why I dropped the zeros in this case, because they're not significant. So as I go from regular number to scientific notation, should not lose significant figures along the way. If I had something like this, 0 0.0004230005003 How many significant figures do I have in this number if it was a measurement? I have no idea because I was just writing numbers to be honest with you. So let's take a look together and see. Let's start with are these significant? They are not. Sometimes people think they are significant because they come after the decimal point, but I have not hit a whole number yet, right? So they are not significant or non-zero number. We would not start counting until we hit this number, right? So that is one, that is two, that is three. All these zeros are going to be significant because they're trapped between two non-zeros. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I think. That leaves me the two zeros at the end. Are they significant? They are significant. So that would be 10, 11, 12. They're significant because way over here, there is a decimal point, right? Does not need to be near those zeros or anything like that. So this would be 12 significant figures, which means if I wrote this in scientific notation, technically speaking, I should keep all those numbers. So it should look something like this. I really should have picked a much smaller amount of numbers, but uh, 4.23005003005. times 10 to the negative four. All those would be kept because they are significant. So again, you do not want to lose any significant figures as you go back and forth. Any questions on how to count there? <clears throat> Now, there are some numbers which are exact numbers. And exact numbers are really found one of two ways. Uh, exact numbers are something that is either counted. So, for example, if I had uh, calculators on my desk here, I'm not going to do some type of experiment to figure out how many I have. I'm just going to simply go, I got one, and count them. So anything that is counted... And more often in chemistry, anything that is a definition or an equality is considered an exact number. So, for example, one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. That is a exact number. Uh, one pound is 453.6 grams. That is an exact number. One foot is 12 inches. Uh, by the way, you should know that, that, and that, I would hope, yes. Maybe three feet in a yard is good to know as well. Anything that is nine pencils, again, it would be something that you would count. We're going to talk about calculations involving significant figures, but anything that is an exact number, the good news is you do not have to worry about them in terms of significant figures when you're doing a calculation. They technically could have as many significant figures as you want because they're an exact number. So when we talk about definitions, though, there is sort of a difference in terms of should I look at these numbers? Should I not look at these numbers? Are they an exact number or not exact number? So earlier we talked about two types of units. We talked about English units, right, and metric units. So if you're using some type of definition that is a English to English conversion, it's an exact number. If you're using something that is a metric to metric conversion, is going to be an exact number. 
if you're using anything that is like an English to metric crossover conversion, it is usually not an exact number. So you usually have to look at the significant figures in that case. These are a few exceptions or the top one there is an exception. Uh, one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. That's English to metric, but that's an exact conversion. So that's an exception. Uh, depending on your book, but they want you here, I think, to learn this one. The one pound is 453.6 grams. That's English to metric, and that is an exact conversion. Some books will just use 454 grams as sort of the number and not really an exact conversion. Um, but uh, if you do cross over English to metric in terms of units, you do want to be careful and you do have to kind of look at the. All right. So for each of these here, take a moment and figure out how many significant figures each one has. Okay. So since we're kind of to end here, let's take a quick look. Um, None of these would be significant. This is where I should start counting, which means all three of those should be significant. So three significant figures on that particular one. This is written in scientific notation, which means all those numbers before the time 10 part will be significant. So four significant figures. This guy would have three significant figures as I would start counting at the one. How many should this one have? 10 grams. It has it has only one. We start counting here. This zero is not significant because there is no decimal point written. So one significant figure. And lastly, this guy has does have four. We would not count until we get to the nine. This zero would be significant because of the decimal point at the end, which would be four significant figures. Any questions on any of that? There? All right. We will lay it up there for